The Cube at IBM Impact 2014 is brought to you by headline sponsor IBM. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Paul Gillen. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Las Vegas for IBM Impact. This is Silicon Angles The, the Cube, Cube, our flagship IBM program. Impact we go out to the events, expect a signal from the noise. Yes. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. Join my co-host Paul Gillen, co-hosting here with Silicon Angle. And our next guest, we're excited to have Steve Mills, Senior Vice President, Group Executive, IBM Software and Systems. Welcome back, Steve, to The Cube again. Good to be here. Great to have you. Uh, I got to say, the uh, Pulse interview was fantastic. We had so many tweetable moments. Um, Quite, quite a great interview, setting the table, really, for what's happening here mm -hmm. with customers. So, uh, first take on uh, Impact here has been about power systems, Blue Mix kind of getting some legs, mm -hmm. uh, the sea legs are kind of getting established. Um, is that what you guys expect? Is that what you guys wanted to say here? And what, what's the key messaging that you guys are putting forth? Well, I think clearly those are uh, the two of the most important focus areas uh, for the conference. Uh, you know, Blue Mix uh, we launched at Pulse and it went into beta. We got the actually many thousands of developers to begin to use it. We're now kind of ready to come out into the marketplace in a more formal way. Um, and Blue Mix is, as we've discussed, uh, it's an open platform for DevOps. It's all about APIs and components, how to rapidly develop applications, and it's sort of ne these next generation applications that are very much around engagement, interaction. Uh, it, it's certainly not the kind of thing you look to for your, you know, your back-end uh, ledger-based systems, but it's all about those end-user-facing and customer-facing environments where you need that kind of rapid development, uh, iteration, mobile device enablement, those kinds of things. And it's, it's where a lot of the excitement is in the industry today. So, you know, Bluemix, you know, open platform, but with back-end integration into, the, into your back-end environments and, and very much uh, geared towards not just what the uh, corporate developer might be looking for, but also the new business startup. Yeah. Uh, the kind of thing where entrepreneurs can come in and, uh, and find componentry that can map against the kinds it, of things that they want to do. It's interesting, the DevOps certainly captured the attention of the, the early adopters around Amazon and the public cloud, but when you start talking about enterprise, it's not just the start of getting a little more resource, it's enterprise grades, serious conversations, so you got, you know, you got to please two masters, the, you know, in-house kind of nuts and bolts in the, in the kitchen, so to speak, and building out mm -hmm. and growing the infrastructure and capabilities, and then the business line manager you mentioned, which are basically like, hey, just get the job done. So, you know, is that something that you see? Is it, is it, is it two masters? Is it, uh, is it designed that way? How do you view that? Is that a misread on my part, or? No, I, I think that, that uh, for, um, you know, whether it's a corporate in-house application development team or somebody uh, who's trying to you know, build up a new capability for commercial sale, you, know, you, you, you do end up serving multiple masters. If your end target audience uh, is going to be a larger size business, you're going to deal with on the one hand, uh, can I get the rapid development and deployment capability that I've come to expect around these DevOps environments? And by the way, I've got to fit into the corporate infrastructure. You know, do I comply with that? So if I'm an entrepreneur starting a company and my, my customer base is going to be enterprises, you know, this, this environment you know, provides me with ways to create those links into traditional enterprise backends. So I arrive not just with the next SaaS offering that stands alone in the cloud, but it's a SaaS offering that integrates better into the corporate customer environment. And let's face it, lots of entrepreneurs are starting companies where their target buyer is a corporate buyer. You've got, of course, you're going up directly against Amazon now. You've been targeting Amazon. You're advertising. It's very clear that that's that they're they're the uh, they're the bad guys right now. Uh, Amazon's buzz has been sort of around. They're the default for the startup company, for the new company to go put everything in the cloud on Amazon. IBM has the legacy of of the enterprise customers. How do you make those enterprise customers that legacy into an asset instead of a liability? Well, a couple of things. First of all, just to sort of correct the record. Uh, the SoftLayers company, we bought them last year. There are more URLs running on SoftLayers than on Amazon AWS. So it, in fact, is a very popular environment uh, for startups. Uh, I think people misjudge that or have bad information. Uh, 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 SoftLayers is more popular, dramatically so, than Google, uh, and is hosting more URLs than any other 
uh, software uh, uh, infrastructure environment in the industry today. So we start out with a good base, uh, with all the classical tools and techniques, uh, get on with a credit card, rapid deployment, now we're adding platform as a service, uh, DevOps, we're bringing our SaaS properties on, we have over 100 SaaS offerings in our portfolio, that'll be up and running on soft layers. And then of course you, you get to the enterprise buyer, who in many cases has been sandboxing in AWS or soft layers or somewhere else, but has often struggled with how does that translate then into production. So I might do some development work out in the cloud, but for reasons of corporate rules and regulations, I'm not putting production. Right, and the SoftLayers environment provides a very unique infrastructure, 1,600 APIs rendered explicit. You can see absolutely everything going on. It maps to the corporate uh, audit and compliance requirements. You know, we're incorporating uh, security services, uh, data loss protection, integration, compliance with different standards. So all of this is, is geared towards uh, satisfying the needs and requirements of the corporate world as well as the startup world. Well, that's interesting. Audit's a great example. I mean, for instance, Amazon's not strong. I don't think they have audits or, uh, at this point, um, but that's a great example. That's, that's table stakes, right? You can't roll into the enterprise without audit. Do you see that? Those kinds of things, the real, the real, the real kind yeah. of the straw that breaks the camel's back to... Well, I think it's absolutely a requirement for, for corporations to go into production. And again, it's providing 100% visibility. Can I see uh, what server I'm running on at the serial number level? Can I see all of the storage volumes that are being used for the data? Can I see all the changes, the updates, so I have a total 100% auditable path for how that environment's been operating and everything that has happened to it? If it's 100% traceable, yeah. I now have the ability to satisfy my auditors that I've got a reliable environment that they can actually interrogate and understand what's happening. Is that just Amazon's just not ready there? They're growing up, and they're still kind of like in elementary school for enterprises, or is it just that just haven't gotten to it yet, or is it a technical limitation from your well, standpoint? Well, you know, I think putting aside for a moment what they have gotten to, the fact of the matter is they haven't necessarily staked out that production yeah. environment you know, as, as being their top environment. I mean, they're, they're, their last few years, obviously they've had a lot of success in attracting startups. Yeah. So, They've you done know, well in the public cloud. Yeah, venture funded companies yeah. you know, find uh, Amazon AWS to be a, a place to start because people's colleagues, you know, they're starting there, so they're attracted to that. Uh, you know, the corporate environment has a lot, of, a lot of other requirements and frankly Amazon will have to do a lot of evolution of their platform to get up to the level of auditability that we We know they're working on it. But wouldn't you like to reach some of those, I and mean, wouldn't you like to have a Netflix in your portfolio? How, how, do you, how do you, what's the strategy for getting to those companies? Well, uh, obviously, uh, you have to provide better economics, better manageability, um, and, and quality of service that makes your environment attractive. So we are, we have a lower, as the amount of data that you need to store away increases, our costs remain relatively linear, and AWS costs skyrocket. So for large amounts of data, and, and the fact of the matter is in all of these public cloud environments, if the only thing you're looking at is cost of compute, you're not looking at the real cost, because the real cost is networking and I.O. And as the data increases, uh, the soft layers environment be actually becomes more economical than the Amazon environment. Needless to say, we're out talking to a lot of companies yeah. about their options of moving on to, to soft layers. By the way, you know, here at, at this event, uh, you know, we're featuring the Aspera technology. Aspera is the underlying uh, high performance, high bandwidth, point to point and multicast technology that underpins Netflix. Yeah. Right, it, it's the mechanism <laughs> they use to, to deliver their streams. So how are you featuring them? Well, we acquired the company. Oh. So they're, they're here at the event and we're, we're showing off this capability. Uh, hey, the tail can wag the dog, as they say, <laughs> you know, so to speak. So, <laughs> uh, you know, so you, look, we're, we're hunting out where the profit pools are. Uh, so it's more than just having a lot of customers or you know, having a lot of volume, it's yeah. also, where can you make the money? I love talking to you, I like how you talk. Claim, stick and claim is a good way to look at things. So, before we talk about power for a second, I want to talk about the cloud marketplace, right? So as you stake out that claim, it's not just an app store, it's not just like the flavor of the month. Talk about the, what, you, what you mean by cloud marketplace. Is it for businesses, is it for the developers, both? What is the, the, the clean positioning of cloud marketplace? Well, where we're going with Marketplace uh, is to make available a very broad range of components um, and API interfaces to invoke function. Um, and this is something that, that we'll populate with components. We're going to work with various companies, systems integrators, and ISVs to encourage them to push their components 
onto the environment. We're going to let our corporate customers actually create their own private development instance within the, the Blue Mix infrastructure. And then they'll use that, uh, that marketplace to get at components that they use. And by the way, they'll be able to put their own components in, but keep them closed. In other words, not open them up. So you have a private marketplace. Yeah, so they have a little private marketplace for themselves. Uh, and you know, everybody knows that, that uh, the greatest efficiency comes through high level of reuse, uh, write less code, you know, reuse the components you have, take advantage of as many API-based interface structures and things that you can pull in, and these, these very uh, uh, highly productive DevOps models are very much based upon this whole idea of, of code less, design more, script, use components, bring things in that are already built. And also so. distribution, developers get distribution and sharing, so there brings that openness feel back to it. Is that Absolutely. part of the design as well? Absolutely part of the design. So it's, you know, you'll, what people will find there is not just things from IBM, but from every other part of the industry. Obviously open source components, things that are available broadly in the marketplace. Yeah. On some of the other environments that are out there, you're going to find those in the IBM environment. So, you know, you think about what people have found and liked about AWS. Think about what they've found and liked about Azure, Heroku, Engine Yard. Go through the list of all those players. All of that and more will be in the IBM marketplace. Now, now Steve, uh, marketplaces as you know, as Apple and Google and Salesforce and such have defined, it's very much a numbers game. It's how many you, mm -hmm. how how many partners you get in there, how many customers you get in there. How will we? How should we evaluate the success of marketplace a year hence? Well, you know, we're going to provide that score sheet of volume. You know, so what starts out as hundreds becomes thousands and then tens of thousands. Obviously at some point now, the richness of the environment is less the issue because you can find a great many things there and then it gets into uh, aspects of tooling, patterns. You know, particularly for, for many developers, they're looking for a pattern to be instantiated in the environment. Let, let, let me show you what others have done. Here's a sample set, here's a pattern. If you want to build this type of application, here are the things that you, you bring together in order to effectively turn it into a kit that delivers the application that you want. But clearly, volume, volume, volume counts in the beginning. Get as many components as you possibly can into the environment, and then begin to create these sample sets, the patterns, the pre-kitted, if you will. All right, so it, it's great to be able to find lots of things. It's even better to be able to find exactly what you want. Steve, I got to ask you about the bubble. Um, I wrote a couple articles this week about it. About obviously, we saw a couple things. Uh, Intel made a big acquisition. I mean, uh, investment in Cloudera, um, huge valuation. I mean, over the top. Uh, Pure storage, which is a storage array, yep. 25 percent the value of NetApp. I mean, three billion dollars. I mean, I mean, it's it's frothy, but it's an innovation bubble. What's your take on this this environment right now? I mean, obviously, valuations are high. Is this an indication of the old storage bubble? Is it a, the convergence? Is it a new animal we've never seen before? I mean, what's your take on that? Well, look, I, I think um, uh, yeah, technology generates a lot of excitement. You know, I mean, the, the information technologies, the transforming, you know, technology certainly of our age and will continue to be. Uh, I think you know throughout the rest of this century, um, and so that creates excitement and it creates a sense of future value. Now, at some point, you look at those valuations and you say, well, how does anybody get a return on that? Uh, but clearly, if someone's willing to spend the money, you sort of say, well, you know, it's kind of like your house. Uh, it might not be as nice as your neighbor's house, but if someone comes in and really wants it, and wants to give you a premium, why yeah. wouldn't you take it type of thing? I mean, Fusion but, but, IO is looking so, pretty good right now, you know, so is but, Violin uh, Memory at $300 million yeah, valuation. You're know, but, but the, the <laughs> saying they overpaid? Well, the, fr the frothiness, it's, it's, it's not a private sustainable, market. right? You know, it, it's, it's not sustainable forever, right? Yeah. So there, you get these peaks and valleys. Uh, you know, WhatsApp, does, does that price make any sense? Uh, uh, only in light of how much money, I guess, Facebook had, 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 had an a equity lot of money. to spend. And by uh, the way, you should know that WhatsApp runs on soft layers. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we nailed that at Pulse. Okay, well, I mean, you, <laughs> you, uh, you've done a lot of small acquisitions, very large number of small acquisitions, and, and uh, by all accounts, a good job of, of integrating them. How about a big acquisition? And what kind of latitude do you have to do a blockbuster? Well, it doesn't really match um, the model that we're on. I, mean, I, I want to be able to take advantage of the skills, the talent, the energy of the companies I acquire without having to spend a lot of time dealing with aspects of, of culture. And the larger the company, the more the cultural issues begin to, to, to weigh you down and slow down the process. We have a huge portfolio, it's in fact the largest software portfolio in the tech industry, 
Uh, as big as it is, there are always gaps. If I can find those gap fillers, uh, then what I can do with those gap fillers is actually put them in my go-to-market capability. I'm in 170 countries with tens of thousands of people representing IBM. I can scale up those companies dramatically faster than they could ever scale on their own, and the IBM shareholder gets a nice return on that investment, right? Because that investment of IBM cash becomes accretive very quickly. The larger the acquisition, the harder it is to run that play. Uh, we've done some, you know, clearly some, some larger large ones. You know, they've been yeah. billions of dollars, but you know, relative to our size, the actual size. Of <laughs> Ten the company, billion is a new one billion. You know, they've been saying. Uh, no, at some point, it doesn't make sense. You guys to have the been good. At, you guys have been good at tuck unders. You guys have. Yeah. You guys pick good value deals, make them part of the engine. That's what yeah. you're saying. saying. Yeah. Take the and, risk and, and off the look, table. It, it's our shareholders' money. You know, we, we work for the people that own us. It's their money. If you're an investor in IBM, you want to see IBM use the money responsibly. And the last thing you ever want to see is an autonomy like acquisition. Yeah. You know, coming from IBM. That's not on our menu. No way, no how. On the white spaces now, obviously being, you guys have a lot of organic R&D going on, so, and also you got the, the M&A, which is kind of the tuck under strategy, which we just talked about. What are the white spaces that you see out there that you, you see it obvious, you know, to be, you know, determined, you know, build out areas that you're going to fill in with organic and, and possibly some uh, M&A deals? Is it the orchestration? Is it automation? What are you looking at as? territories that you need to claim there? Well, it, it, first of all, we look across our whole portfolio as to the, the kinds of things that we want to go after. Um, and you know, it, it's understanding the patterns of implementation of the products we have, where do those gaps exist, and would a piece of technology from another company fill in that gap. Very often, we're partnering with the companies that we buy before we buy them. So we see how they fill that gap and what the leverage is. Um, <laughs> and we're investing, obviously, in the hot areas. So, you know, you think about, you know, mobile, security, um, you know, all kinds of analytics-related uh, acquisitions, uh, things that fit into the cloud, which is more about deployment. Um, so, you know, we're investing where the market is moving the fastest. Because that, that's where the greatest pressure is to, you know, try to keep up with where the market's going. Uh, we did set out to talk about power, so we should talk a little bit about power <laughs> before we're done here. Uh, open power, you got a huge endorsement from Google today, said it's moving its stack to open power. However, it occurs to me you're taking on Intel, and essentially you're competing with Intel now, at a time when you have a lot of other initiatives to pay attention to. Why is the open power initiative not a distraction from other bigger prizes you could be going after? Well, power is a big business for us. There are 100,000 plus companies out there that use power, it's an important franchise, um, and we're looking at it from a long-term perspective. Uh, the market, I think, has been looking for server alternatives. You know, clearly the server market space has compressed as far as players are concerned. IBM and Intel are viewed as kind of the, the last two companies standing. Um, and clearly Intel has volume advantages, no question about yeah. it. You know, so we're looking at our position in the marketplace and what companies like Google and others are looking for to balance out their server portfolio. What attracted them to power uh, was the fact that this is a, a very high performing chip. Uh, it's got excellent threading characteristics, data throughput. So the amount of compute power you know, per unit of, of electricity consumed and heat output is outstanding. You then combine that with, a, with an open licensing model which is what we adopted around open power. We essentially looked at the kind of licensing patterns that ARM, for example, has benefited from, which is the popular uh, uh, chip in, in handheld devices. And so we've gone out with this ARM style licensing. Uh, that means that for relatively low entry point cost, you become part of open power. Uh, you can source from us, you can actually fabricate with others, so you're not uniquely tied to IBM. You can find others that can uh, make these kinds of things. You can do derivative works you know, off of, off of your license. So it's a non-restrictive license, it's not a proprietary license, it, you it's do an open license. Derivative works, but how is this different from a GNU public license, that, that type of model, where, where, you're, where you're, your derivative works become part of the, part of the, uh, uh, the, the open stack? Um, well, we're not using a GPL style licensing, right? So, you know, Dual if you want to do extensions, you can do extensions, and those are your extensions. So you think of Apache style licensing mm -hmm. in the like software world, you know, you can actually leverage our license in the same way you, you would. You don't have to contribute the IP back to the, right. to the But you pool. own right. the extensions you create. You, you own yeah. the extensions that you create. Oh, by the way, as a participant in the community, you can also offer those extensions back. So there you have choice. It's not dissimilar from other 
uh, if you will, non-GPL like licensing models where you have yeah. the freedom of action, but if, as a community participant, you may very well want to push, innovation. It, push it back in. It spurs is on there, innovation. Is there, another shoe? is there another shoe to drop in the Google relationship? They're gonna, they have enabled <laughs> their stack on, uh, on, on power. You know, and, and they obviously, they acquire chips, they go to third party fabricators, and you know, they make the sleds that shove into their racks, and, and power will now be part of their configuration. Steve, what's your big bet on the power? I mean, obviously you're seeing some trends that we were speculating earlier on, obviously that we're going into a maker movement like developer market where you got tinkerers playing with hardware and software, so the threading thing makes a lot of sense there, but also the analytics market with Internet of Things is exploding. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, ingesting unstructured data and just dealing with it later yeah. is a big part of the analytics piece. Did you see those things? Is that one of the big, what's your big bet? Are those? Well, one of the key design points of Power 8 and the, and the Power family going forward is you know, what we refer to as this high performance bus architecture that allows essentially a coherent programming environment, but you can connect other processors into power. So I program through the power chip, that's what my developers see, but I can actually schedule a workout to a field programmable gate array, uh, to a GPU. So you know we're partnering with you know NVIDIA, <laughs> you know, Altera, Xilinx, the popular providers, and therefore you know, we're allowing those that want to engineer yeah. unique system structures to be able to do that. So if I wanted unique encryption, right, to improve my security, you know, I could use an FPGA and do custom encryption. Uh, if I wanted to do some kind of advanced analytics, uh, Hadoop-related speed-ups, uh, you know, I want to do pre-processing around predicates and sorts and, and those things, I could be using the NVIDIA GPU, program natively yeah. through the power chip, but get all these other advantages. And so we've made this an open environment that you can plug other things in. So in a sense, you can build your own hot rod. I mean, this is all part of the yeah, maker yeah. movement, right? Oh it's, no, I love it. Because everybody wants to build their own hot rod. Yeah, yeah. You know, and if the, the pieces and the components are there, and you have good engineering skills, you can build your own hot rod. It's like American this. graffiti for, for technology, just cruising down Main Street with your hot rod. Absolutely. So, what, what does your yeah. hot rod need to do? You know, is it big data, big transactions, low latency, uh, data encryption? You, you talk about the domain, and we can adapt. So to you that get domain. your souped-up uh, device or car yep. with, the, with the engine you want under the hood. But what's interesting too, would it be safe to say the statement that uh, with power systems, the big bet is that you can provide high performance technology at the same time support scale out open, uh, open source uh, commodity hardware. Exactly. So that's essentially the bet, right? Yeah. No, You're we, not going to we, pick, a, pick a side. No, you, can, we, you can win we, in both. We moved the architecture to little Indian. We've made you know, Linux 100% portable without change across into the power environment. We make it easy for all that work to come across. We have this hot rodding capability <laughs> around the architecture, <laughs> open licensing. You know, yeah. so it's, it's, it, it's, it's multiple dimensions in which to leverage the base level capability of power, which has always gotten high marks for you know, its scalability yeah, yeah. characteristics. Um, you bring it, it to the common man now. And now, now make it possible for, developer. for other engineers to jump in and do their own thing around this environment. And frankly, that's what many people in the industry want to do. They want to, they want to do their own thing. Steve, anything uh, in the Watson area specific to power, will we see a kind of a Watson hot rod that, that IBM might build? Uh, well, uh, Watson runs on Linux on power today, where all of the Watson deployments we're doing are being done on power. Right, but um, optimized power and then, is what I mean. And with Power 8, uh, we already have a level of optimization through Power 8's unique features, you know, for high bandwidth I.O. Uh, and threading. And then we're actually doing a set of customizations specifically for Watson to take advantage of the NVIDIA GPUs and how they can speed up some of that work that, that the cognitive system needs to do. We, it seems like So there'll Watson, be a Watson hot rod. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Judith Hurwitz was on earlier talking about Watson and, and saying that, that Watson is such a complicated uh, uh, ecosystem. There's so much to Watson that, that it's, uh, IBM has to move slowly in, in moving it out there really as a, as, as a general purpose engine. Are we going to see, we've seen a lot in healthcare lately, are we going to see other industries go big in Watson in the near future? Uh, financial yeah, and services we've in had some, We've had, already had some announcements in financial services, insurance, uh, advisory type services, the things that would be clearly a bit simpler than the healthcare challenge that we're taking on with Watson. Um, you know, we have announced at this event uh, a, uh, a Watson environment for corporate developers to actually come in and, and sandbox. We're encouraging entrepreneurs 
Uh, we've got a dozen different universities that beginning their next uh, uh, fall cycle will begin to teach the principles and structures around the Watson environment. So we are clearly opening up to a broader ecosystem and we've made it modular. It's, it's, it's a system, but we've modularized around a platform structure so you can effectively only use the pieces that matter to your particular application scenario. So Steve, if I want to shift gears into big data, but before we do that, I want to let you know that you're famous on Twitter because you now have a fake Steve Mills Twitter yeah, handle. I, I, Did you see I, that? Yeah, I've, I've seen this before. <laughs> I don't know who this individual is, but they... Uh, They're certainly not they, doing a good job being the fake Steve Mills. Yeah, they, they do seem to want to take advantage of... Uh, <laughs> Um, obviously, <laughs> Twitter's it's just, a compliment. We love, we, it's, it's a com <laughs> consider it a, flag, yeah. a compliment. Uh, but that brings up you know social data as a form of big data. So I got to ask you: Do you see data as just a part of the fabric of the platform across the portfolio, or do you see it becoming a P and L? Because we've talked to folks today um, from power um, to streaming, um, you know, web sphere across the board. There's all big data nuggets kind of you know sprinkled into the platform. Is it going to be just an embedded feature across the portfolio, or is, will there be a P? Is there a P and L and around well, it? Well, first of all, we do measure our our total business analytics business. Uh, Bob Picciano, who works for me, has responsibility for all the basic material yeah. that makes up our business and analytics portfolio, and that includes those things that apply to big data scenarios. So that's then solutions. Now, yeah. Yes. Now, okay. frankly, I haven't met anybody recently that's doing little data. Yeah. So, you know, every <laughs> analytics project that I'm touching is always big, you know, and it's, you know, it, it's, it's how many terabytes, you know, often in the hundreds yeah. on the way to petabyte scale environment. So I do think that, that the market has moved in that direction because the price points have come down, the ability to ingest and analyze more data has improved economically, and so businesses are saying, well, if I can bring in more data, can I find more patterns? Can I unearth yeah. more nuggets, more jewels, things I could act upon that previously I couldn't act upon because I could never afford to bring all that much data together. So, you know, frankly, all these analytics projects have become big data. It's hard to nail the technology you're saying into one division, yeah. but the solutions you certainly can pee in it, price out, and sell Absolutely, to. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, it, and it, frankly, it's mixed data types. You know, it's structured and unstructured, uh, and classical relational fits, but certainly not the only technology. And you've got to deal with the document format data, graph data, you know, object-oriented structures, so you know, many different data types uh, and techniques. We have a very broad portfolio that, that touches on all these different mechanisms. We're a Hadoop distributor. You saw we acquired Cloudant uh, yeah. recently. Uh, we're doing a lot of things around you know, very complex data structures uh, in many industries. Is big data a, uh, a P&L for you, or is it an app? Uh, well, well, uh, business analytics and database are P&L structures for us. Yeah. We don't explicitly break out big data as a unique space just because it's broad. what happens is everything is quickly big data. Yeah. Right. It, it, right. It, again, who's doing small all data? data? All know, data just, is big data, yeah. You know, that's just the way of the world. You know, that's, so that's where the world's going. We were joking earlier um, about back to the 80s, we were talking about some of the, how the mainframe selling with the 50th anniversary, you know, the innovation around that, and, and so just some of the terminology we've been kicking around today, data processing, decision support systems, MIS. <laughs> We, it feels a lot like those days of, you know, when, 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 when though that kind of language is being used. Now you're hearing it mainstream, pipelining data uh, in, in, in this new era of cloud. So is cloud the mainframe, was, has always been the discussion. How does that look like? I'm not saying the mainframe for mm -hmm. IBM, but like as a metaphor, um, it seems like a mainframe. You, I mean, power systems, you're essentially saying, here's some high performance capacity in brains to whatever you're connected to, here's a marketplace. It feels like a mainframe. Do you guys yeah, I, I, we'll, we'll see how these things evolve. I, I think that the, um, we're really, in many ways, at the early stage around these public cloud environments. Now, there are numerous companies measured in the tens of thousands that have been delivering services electronically, and they're often production services, and by the way, mainframes are part of their environment. You know, so if you go into to ADP, Depository Trust Company, you know, go into to, to United Parcel Service, anybody that's put up electronic services around their capability, you know, you'll often find mainframes involved in that service offering. The, their customers are interested in the outcome. They're less interested in what the underlying technology is. But as a provider, they've built up an incredible reputation for reliability, availability, you know, security and so on. They're trusted providers. The public cloud environment you know, has obviously been characterized by startup companies, entrepreneurial activity, uh, a lot of systems of engagement 
types of approaches, you know, new apps that are touching users, not nearly as much on the on the production side. But the but this public cloud world will grow up to deliver more production ready infrastructure and some of those mainframe attributes are going to have to be evident in the environment for reliability, availability, failover, recovery, et cetera. My final question for you is going to be more about what is the, the outcome of the cloud, going to, the ultimate uh, determinant of cloud success uh, for all the folks out there. You see what Microsoft's doing, they got a war chest of in the billions, you know, some say 30 to 50 billion for M&A activity, you the new CEO over there, you got HP, you guys and everyone else, Amazon. What are, the, what are going to be the key determining factors for the cloud? Is it going to be economics? Is it going to be scale? What's your take on, on how you view that chess game? Well, the top 10 items are economics. I mean, you, you can't deny that it's economics because <laughs> information technology is a tool that you use to power a business. And so the business model comes first, the technology comes second. And when the economics are right, you can do more with technology. You know, and it's not that other attributes are not important, but the economics take precedent. Uh, and the excitement around public cloud uh, is very much driven by the perception that I can find better economics. Can I be more agile? Can I adjust and adapt? Can I get the technology that I need when I need it, but not necessarily have to pay for all of it up front? So all those are appeal points and they're very much tied to, to economics. Uh, so that, that is the fundamental driving force. I think one of the mistakes though that is often made in describing the market as it exists today is to ignore the thousands of companies that are business process service companies who predate the use of the term cloud, <laughs> but who nonetheless are delivering very valuable services electronically. And businesses have for decades been, been de-verticalizing in effect. You know, as a company I might have had all my own systems doing all my own apps 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Today I use all kinds of providers, and some of them could be literally born on the web. Mm -hmm. It might very well be salesforce.com for my Salesforce, but it could be ADP for my finance department. And ADP is as much in the cloud as Salesforce is. They're as much a dot-com as Salesforce is a dot-com. You know, it's just a different constituency that's being served by an electronic service. The final question I'd have is, is how you're helping internally make that switch, because we see a lot in the, re in the reseller channel, mm -hmm. in the integrator channel, they're trying to move from this box sale of, of compensation structure to selling subscriptions, mm -hmm. having a lot of difficulties with their sales force making that transition. What have you been able to do? What kind of success have you had in getting your sales force to transition to selling subscription services? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, we did the very simple thing of compensating them equivalent to whether it's on-premise or in SaaS, which means we apply a multiplier that delivers to them compensation. They become neutral oh, to the That's deployment. a good solution. Okay. So that's a starting point. <laughs> <laughs> so have, is, yeah, sales reps are coin-operated. If you don't come Absolutely. up with a coin, they're not going to they're not going to respond. But I think you, even more important to the point that you're making uh, is that that Around all of these services, if, if information technology is something that transforms business, that it's not just the product itself, but rather the roadmap for transformation, which means that there's a services model that goes behind all of these software as a service offerings. How do I get onboarded? How do I adjust my business process to match what the SaaS offering does? So there are big services opportunities, implementation opportunities. You know, frankly, our, many of our partners are, are truthfully regional systems integrators that also carry technology. We're allowing them to participate in the SaaS sale, but in particular, they're engaged in the onboarding, and in the enabling of process to actually make the SaaS offering do something for the customer. Steve, thanks so much for joining us. I know you're pressed for time. I'll give you the final word. Share with the folks out there the, the bumper sticker for uh, your customers and your troops internally for your mission over the next year. What's the, what's the, what's the, what's the bumper sticker to the troops and the customers? Well, let, let me express the bumper sticker in terms of this particular <laughs> event that we're at, because uh, we do a lot of things in IBM. Uh, but you know, th this event is showing people how you know, this whole idea of, of rapid, agile, flexible um, uh, invention, innovation, you know, can take place within businesses by taking advantage of the kinds of tools and offerings that, that we're bringing to the marketplace. You know, it's lifting the classical middleware infrastructure environment, you know, if you will, up to this next generation of interfaces, uses, mobility, flexibility, DevOps, you know, it, it's overlaying the new things into that infrastructure, and it, what it effectively does is it renews the infrastructure. You know, when you're a 100-year-old company like IBM, you spend a lot of time focusing on how you bring renewal 
to all the things that you do for businesses. The vitality of our portfolio and the importance of the role we play with our clients is directly related to this idea of renewing, renewing, renewing. And if you can bring that renewal around the latest capability to bear, the customers want to go with you because they've made a big investment over a long period of time. Steve Mills, Senior Vice President here at IBM Edge, I mean IBM Impact. Uh, be right back with our next guest after this short break. <laughs>